So, um, welcome um, to this first session today. And uh, Olivia, you already pointed out quite well, this talk is not going to be on the, um, on the nitty gritty details of, of data uh, fitting or something like that, but it's much more conceptual. It's going to be also a little bit basic maybe. I wanna actually give you an overview um, over different experimental designs that uh, you can use in your fMRI experiments. So it's about functional activation and connectivity, which I'm talking about mainly functional activation. Um, and my goal is also to, to um, point you to some watchouts you should consider um, when planning your experiment. Um, at that uh, uh, point, I also want to say thank you to all those who have uh, done this lecture before me, um, where I could um, um, take a lot of over from their, from their um, slides and sessions. And uh, with that, you will see that some of the examples are pretty old uh, from the beginnings uh, of the SPM um, era, but uh, very good to illustrate the examples uh, or the, the points I want to make. And uh, I want to start with the most important slide of the session. Um, now that the minds are still fresh, um, the good design is the utter most important for your um, for your um, fMRI experiment because with um, the design, you first have to think carefully about the process you want to measure, and this will lead you immediately to the question, how do I need to plan my experiment in order to measure that specific process? So um, this is at the very heart of functional mapping, this question. And to give you a little example, um, just as an illustration, assume that you want to know what brain areas support uh, your ability to differentiate between car brands uh, and with that i don't mean to 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 look at the icon at the car but to really know by just the the overall appearance of the car which brand it is um, and i have to admit that this example was inspired by my little two-year-old son who is already pretty good at that and i'm wondering what what brain regions are in this little brain um, are supporting this ability already at that age. Um, so the first thing you have to think about is what is the cognitive process you're interested in? And this is um, very conceptual and uh, requires digging in the literature, um, being um, uh, reading the papers um, and to isolate the, the process itself. Is it something about memory, something about visual perception? Maybe um, it's something about visual expertise. Um, so that's the first step. And you should not underestimate the time it takes to really um, um, nail this down to the, to, the important, to the important processes. The next step will then be to think, uh, how can I isolate this cognitive process in my fMRI experiment? So this is about the experimental design where you wanna put your participants in the scanner and you ask, okay, uh, what should I present to my participants? Could it be I just present one car after each other and just acquire the brain activation? Might maybe not be the very best idea. We will come to this, um, in, this, in, this in this session. Um, you might also think, okay, maybe I want to show them two cars at the same time, and they should um, think about what discriminates the different tasks, uh, the different cars. Could also be an option, but you might also think, okay, maybe here I'm measuring rather the ability to discriminate between black and white, so maybe I should go along with a nice control condition as well. So you might want to additionally show them um, a nice uh, set of, of, of stimulus pairs which are controlling for basic visual attributes. This is, um, to be honest, a fun example, and I have not thought through the um, perceptual expertise literature I didn't read in detail, and so this is nothing you should take seriously. I just wanted to illustrate that the idea of finding a good control condition or to, to, to plan your experiment is not trivial at all. So, um, the um, 
the planning of, of your experiment is immediately related to our, uh, the way our brain works or the neurophysiology of our brain. Um, the bold signal itself is not an absolute measure. So you can't just put a participant in the scanner and uh, show one stimulus and you get a value you can interpret. It's not meaningful. So you always need a, a comparison condition, a control condition, where you can compare your experimental condition to. Uh, to. And um, so it would be smart if you find um, a control condition or a comparison um, which maximizes the difference in the mean response between um, uh, 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 the, the, the difference uh, between the experimental condition and the control condition. So this is about the sensitivity, uh, which you can immediately address by being smart in choosing your control condition. And as a simple example, um, for instance, uh, your, your experimental condition could be finger tapping. Um, and in order to isolate now uh, brain regions which are um, responsive to this task, uh, you want to have control condition which maximizes the difference. For instance, a rest condition where the participants do not engage in finger tapping. Now, this is a, a slide. I'm, I'm sure you saw this already several times um, in the course. It's the SPM processing hierarchy. And um, so the, the um, experimental um, design um, directly translates into your design matrix. So this is the, the um, position in the design, in the, in the hierarchy, um, where you will find your um, design directly, the experimental design. However, um, of course, the design itself or the way you plan your experiment is not um, only relevant at the, at the stage where you start to do your statistical analysis. It is important right away because depending on the way um, you are assessing um, your data, you will define at the very beginning what kind of questions you can address, what kind of contrasts you can compute, and what kind of, of um, like how straightforward you can address the question you're interested in. So the design matrix or the design matrix might be at the in the middle in, in your in your hierarchy. However, the experimental design is right at the beginning. Okay, so um, I want to give you um, a first overview over experimental designs. So let's go back to the st statistical roots. Um, these are all parametric designs you can find here, current categorical designs, parametric designs, and factorial designs. Um, these designs are all endorsed by the general linear model, which is the statistical um, overarching uh, model, which is used in SPM. And um, the categorical designs are the most simple forms of designs you can use for fMRI. So we just saw in the previous slide, one of the previous slides, you just ask about um, a change in mean signal intensity between two conditions. Uh, for instance, finger tapping and rest. And if you do this and you just look at the difference, you will find activation in the motor cortex of, on the contralateral side, for instance. Um, uh, an important term which comes along uh, with the categorical design is cognitive subtraction. And cognitive subtraction, this is the basic idea behind it. You just uh, subtract condition A and condition B. Um, but this comes along with, uh, with some caveats, uh, which I will come to um, in a second. Then we have the parametric designs. It's also pretty st uh, straightforward. Uh, you ask about the systematic relationship uh, between your bold signal on the one hand and um, the amount or intensity of a process on the other hand. Um, for instance, uh, uh, you could ask what kind, uh, what brain region is responsive to an increase in the um, frequency you're doing your finger tapping. The faster you do finger tapping, what brain region is reacting to this, sensitive to this increase? Um, you address this with a parametric design, and uh, it's not surprisingly, it's also something you um, you will find the, the primary motor cortex and the hand not to be sensitive to. And 
as a third example, a th third type of design, there is the factorial design, which is a more um, general term. The parametric designs can be integrated into factorial designs, and also the categorical design is, so, so to speak, a, a, an aspect of the factorial design. Um, here, you explicitly address the question whether um, the difference between two conditions is somehow be dependent on a specific context. So you are sensitive in the factorial designs um, uh, to interaction effects. Um, now let's uh, look at an example also from the um, topic of, of, of finger tapping. You could ask, for instance, is the difference between tapping versus rest somehow modulated by the age of the subjects? So you can um, now compare the contrast uh, cognitive subtraction uh, in the first group with the contrast um, in the second group and ask for an interaction effect with age. You could also, instead of differentiating between um, the two groups here, adults and kids, you could also use a parametric regressor and ask whether um, there's an act uh, an, an, a correlation of brain, activa uh, uh, brain activation with age would also be possible. That's a rough overview um, over the designs. This is already giving us also the outline of the session because we will start off again with the categorical designs and then walk through to parametric designs uh, and finally to the pictorial designs. We will start off with the cognitive subtraction and with the problems or challenges which they come about. So the idea of cognitive subtraction is very intuitive, pretty easy. Um, the idea is that we want to find the neural structures which are underlying a specific process. For instance, um, perceptual expertise in cars. And so the procedure is that you construct a condition where subjects engage in your process of interest. And then you have another condition where the subjects do a similar task, but they do not engage in the process you're interested in. When you then subtract the brain activation in the first condition, the experimental condition, and control condition, you are left with activation which can be attributed to your process of interest. A nice example, which I took from a workshop slide deck from the fMRI uh, B um, um, a group uh, by Bishop, is this one here. You have two stimuli which are presenting an experimental stimuli on the left side in the control condition. Um, subjects see this control stimulus, um, and those two stimuli are matched in all aspects except for the aspect of interest which is color. So these, um, in this example, uh, the interest, the research question was on color processing and you can isolate the area, the brain region, which is supporting this function. Um, straightforward, easy to understand. However, and that's a big however, we have, to, we have two challenges. First thing is we have really have to think um, well and hard about a good control condition. Depending on the uh, research question, it can be very, very tricky to find a good control task. That's the first thing which is difficult about cognitive subtraction. The second thing is um, the assumption of pure insertion. I come to this later. Let's first start with the control task um, or finding actually a good baseline. Uh, we always need to compare our uh, bold signal to some reference signal. And the reference signal should be um, defined by a control task. Now, let's assume we want to study the neural structures which support face recognition. And you can think of an experiment where the participants see faces, a lot of faces. And now you're thinking about what's could, what could be a good control task to that. Uh, and you know, for cognitive stress subtraction, the control task should be matched in all respects except for the process of interest. Now let's look at different versions and different 
options you can you can now um, choose for your baseline condition. For instance, here you have um, just a, a crosshair which your participants are watching during the baseline compared um, to the experimental condition where you just uh, present the face. What do you think? Is, is this a good control task? I'm pretty sure that most of you are shaking your heads. Yes, it's not a good control task because the control condition here is very different to the experimental condition in various aspects. So um, starting off with basic perceptual aspects uh, like uh, the complexity of the image, color, luminance, and so on. But also when you just present a fixation cross, there might be quite different things going on in the brain. So your subject might uh, think of, mm, I'm hungry, for instance, um, or something different. They might engage in mind wandering. And you might not want to have your subject engage in mind wandering during your control condition. It depends on the re research question. Um, but normally, this is not a good control. Now, an alternative would be, OK, let's take a different stimulus, but keep the same task. So for instance, you can, as a control condition, show a similarly complex object, like here, a burger. And the subjects are asked to, again, do the very same um, cognitive process in terms of naming it, which is certainly part of the recognition um, uh, uh, operation uh, they should engage in. Now, um, this is certainly a better control condition compared to just a fixation cross. Uh, but actually, the, the, the burger itself is again very, very different to the face stimulus. Now we have to think about the cognitive, uh, the, the, the cognitive process we're interested in. Are we interested? in face recognition? How about face perception? Now, if we are also interested, if we're only interested in face recognition, we might control for the mere perception of facial attributes, which is not done here. So both might, depending on the research question, not be the best controlled tasks. Um, so you might want to match your baseline as close as possibly in, pers uh, in, in, in perceptual features um, with your experimental condition. So you also show a face. And what you could, for instance, ask your subjects to do is recognize the face as famous or not. Um, this should include the process of interest, face recognition. However, you can imagine that when subjects see the face uh, depicted on the right, that they wonder, mm, should I know that person? Is that maybe a famous person? So they are implicitly again engaging in face recognition to some extent. They might even think harder than in the experimental condition, um, engage even more. So this would also maybe not answer your research question well. And um, a smart way to um, address the problem of differences in, in, in um, perceptual um, properties is to use the very same stimulus, but ask the subjects to engage in a different task. So uh, while um, face recognition could be addressed by um, having the subjects name the, per the person, uh, you may, might ask the subjects to simply name the gender in the control condition. But again, we can assume that the recognition of faces will also happen in the control condition here on an implicit basis. And it's another problem with showing the same stimulus twice, which I come to in a second. Um, I hope it's getting clear that the um, choice of your baseline condition is not trivial. You have to think carefully. You have to know very well the concept or the, the cognitive process you're interested in and how to best address this then in a baseline condition um, to um, not cancel it out, for instance, 
or to not um, be left with unexplained brain activation due to uh, suboptimal matching of different properties. Now, um, I brought some data and I want to give you a little hands-on um, experience. Um, very simple, but um, so that you see also how to implement this contrast in the SPM GUI. Of course, later on, you can also easily script everything, of course. Um, I brought the so-called face matching task, which is a task which has been used very, very often. And um, it's about face processing, maybe also emotion processing. If you see the experimental condition, it's uh, emotional faces with a negative emotion. And the control condition is um, about shapes. And the task for the participants is to match um, the upper face or the upper shape to one of the um, stimuli shown just below. Uh, and they have to indicate by, uh, by button press whether it matches the left or the right um, stimulus. This task is a, a block design task. Uh, these stimuli are shown um, uh, in trials, uh, which are um, shown uh, in blocks. So you have several trials of face matching in a block. Uh, then it, uh, the subject engage in, in, in um, sh matching shapes several trials of shape matching in a block. And this is done four times per condition. So it's a short task of not even five minutes. First question, do you think this is a good control condition? Yeah, I leave it to you to answer that question, but I want to say here that it really, really very much depends on the research question whether you can re work with this contrast or not. Um, I will now open the GUI. Are you still seeing this, the, the screen? Yes, okay, thanks for nodding. I hope it's, it's, it's big enough so that you can all see um, because I can't enlarge it. Um, so here you can see the uh, design matrix um, of this faces task, uh, face matching task. And uh, uh, just to, to, to give you an orientation, these are the two task regressors. You have um, uh, the first regressor is the control condition actually, it is, uh, it is shape matching. And you see the first block is shape matching, then the second block, when this is the timeline, it's a single subject uh, set uh, model. Um, I have to, uh, to say it's a single subject um, data set. The second um, uh, block is um, face matching. The third block uh, is, is shape matching. And so we have four blocks per, uh, per condition, two task regresses. And this is a very um, nice example of a simple cognitive subtraction. You can formulate your contrast by putting like a one and a minus one over the two um, regressors. If you put a plus one here on the faces regressor, you ask um, what brain areas show a stronger activation to your face stimulus compared to, and that's a minus one to your, um, to the shapes. Um, so this is easily entered into the GUI. Let's do an uh, family-wise error corrected thresholding, and then you can um, inspect the results. Um, face matching um, leads to a much higher activation in visual areas extending into the fusiform face area compared to shape matching, something you would expect. And to give you also um, a taste how to enter this into the, into the, um, the GUI, uh, if you wanna define a new contrast, let's say we want to just reverse the contrast and we are interested in what brain regions are responding stronger to face matching than uh, to shape matching than to face matching. Let's say define your contrast. You uh, write one um, as a uh, weight 
to the regressor number one and a minus one, you leave a space in between, a minus one for the second regressor. Uh, sorry, of course, this is something you have to write here in the contrast uh, weights. And this is shapes greater faces. And then you just hit OK. Let's see whether something survives on family wise error correction threshold. It's a single subject. Yeah, here we go. Um, so, a very different activation pattern you find uh, when um, just reversing the contrast. And this is an easy example of cognitive subtraction. Okay. Now let's come to the second challenge, which comes with cognitive subtraction. And this is the assumption of pure insertion. Um, the pure insertion assumption is practically um, illustrated in these two latte macchiatos. As a copy lover, lover I, I uh, had the idea last time to, to illustrate it like this. The idea is that um, in pure insertion, um, adding a component would not affect other components. In terms of the brain, it would mean adding a specific cognitive process in a task will not affect other processes which are going on in the brain. And um, translated into the latte macchiato, adding coffee will not affect the milk. Uh, so the, on the left side, the latte macchiato is uh, close to, pretty close to pure insertion, whereas on the right side, the adding, the, uh, having added the coffee, have already affected quite a lot the milk. So this is not pure insertion. And I can tell you that the brain is much more like the right latte macchiato and not so much like the left. Uh, our brain is working quite non-linearly and adding a cognitive process will, for sure, interact with other processes which are going on in the brain. This is illustrated here. Um, if you have your process P, which is not here um, in this condition, if you edit in your experimental condition, it will affect other processes which are going on in the brain. So for instance, process yellow and process green are extending. There is a process blue, which is um, emerging in the brain, which has not been there before you um, entered the, or uh, in, um, uh, before you edit process P. Now, when you do your um, subtraction, you're not only ending up with the brain activation, um, which relates to your process P, but you're also ending up with all those effects which have been um, uh, initiated by including process P in the first place. These are interactions. And you can't address those interactions with simple cognitive subtraction. That's another way of showing this problem. We have two problems. Find the, the baseline challenge we've already talked about. It's about matching. The second is the pure insertion. And um, in a perfect world, uh, no, that's, that's actually wrong. It's good that our brain is working in a non-linear fashion. Um, but in the, uh, from the perspective of pure insertion, if you have a process A and a process B, if you add them, they just sum up. However, the, the, this, is, this is the exception. Um, and the rule is rather that if you combine two processes, there the effect is either larger than the sum or smaller than the sum. Um, so we have interactions going on, which result, for instance, from integrating the two processes in the brain. They do not exist separately next to each other, but there is mostly some kind of integration, modulation, um, and in the end, you have interaction effects, which you can't address with cognitive subtraction. Um, one kind of interaction effect um, which we already um, um, addressed or which we were talking about uh, in the baseline problem 
um, is time, um, where we thought about the smart solution of showing the very same stimulus twice, once in the experimental condition and a second time in the control condition, but you just change the task the, pro uh, the, 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 par the participants are engaging in. Now, it is well known that if you present a stimulus twice, your brain is adapting. So the activation in response to the second, um, to the second uh, presentation is, is reduced. So this is actually a um, peristimulus um, chart, um, and that's the bold response to one, one um, presentation. If you do not take into account that time has a modulatory effect on your brain activation, you might come up with the interpretation, oh, okay, so when I name the gender, I have a much less activation in the visual cortex, the cortices, than when I have to name the person. But that would be wrong because the effect is driven by a mere adaptation effect in the brain. So this is just one little example of how interactions take place. The brain works always in context and the context always in, in, in influences the processes uh, in the brain. Um, this is a very um, old example also. Uh, in the early days of fMRI, they often used the cognitive subtraction since it's really very straightforward and easy to interpret. Um, that was a study where uh, subjects had to view faces and objects, and you can see in the uh, two different areas outlined here, fusiform virus and uh, some other spots, uh, also somewhere fusiform, that you have um, an increase and decrease depending on this type of stimulus. But this assumption is only valid oops, under the, or this interpretation is only valid under the assumption of pure insertion. And nowadays, you would not do this like this anymore. Now, um, I will come to one way how you can address this problem, both uh, the problem of the baseline challenge and the problem of pure insertion. This conjunction. Um, just a reminder, we just had that. When you include a process, in the brain, mostly you end up with not only this process P, but also with interactions when you do the to the contrast, which we can't explicitly isolate if you only have one single contrast. Now let's assume we don't, uh, we not only have one contrast, but we have a second pair of conditions, and in the second pair of conditions, we also include our process of interest. So again, we have a control condition which is different to the control or to the task we had in our contrast one. We also, in the experimental condition, add deliberately the process B. And again, when we do the contrast between those two, we are left with activation, which we can um, relate to process P, but also with some interaction effects we're not interested in. Now, the smart thing is that in both contrasts, we know there must be the neurocorrelates included relating to process P. And what we now can do is we look at the commonalities between those two contrasts. The idea is now that the two contrasts have in common our process of interest and interaction effects which might have emerged due to the insertion of process P are uh, unwanted and to some extent random and they should in the end cancel out. But if we just look at the overlap, and this is what is um, meant with conjunction, we are left with the activation relating to process P. So that's a logical end what we do in conjunction. It's a successive um, testing of the cognitive subtraction, which we in the end combine. This is a schematic um, 
outline of the two basic principles of subtraction and of conjunction analysis. Let's again start with subtraction, just as an illustration. Um, we have in subtraction analysis conditions, A and B. For instance, uh, uh, naming a person and um, naming the gender. Let's assume our tasks include five processes. And um, the experimental condition um, and the task, uh, the control condition, they are perfectly matched except for our uh, process of interest, PE, process of interest, um, which we deliberately did not match so that in the contrast, we should end up with activation relating to contrast uh, to the cognitive process P. Um, this would be valid under the assumption of Turing version. In conjunction analysis, we have not only one contrast, but we have a second contrast or even more. And again, let's assume in the first contrast where we uh, compare A and B, we have five um, cognitive processes. Um, in this task pair or contrast in the first one, we have the process one, which is perfectly matched, the process two, which is only um, included in the first condition, so it is not matched, and in the contrast, it should show up as activation. Process three is not included at all in both conditions, so we don't have to matter. Our process of interest is not matched, and we did not want to match it since we are interested in the neurocorrelates of it. And uh, process number five, here there's again a perfect match. Um, so when we do the contrast image here, we end up with activation relating to process four and also to process two. Now we have a second contrast image, again, comparing an experimental condition, which contains our process of interest, and a control condition, which is rather poor. But um, here, process one is not included at all in both conditions. Process two is perfectly matched. Process three, this time, is not matched. So we will end up with activation relating to process uh, three. And process four is not matched as well, since it's our process of interest. Process five is not interested. Uh, it's not interesting because it's not included. The idea is now, when we do a conjunction of those two contrasts, the effect of process two and process three, which are not matched in either the one contrast or the other con contrast, don't show up in the conjunction. The only thing we're left with is the brain activation relating to our process of interest. So what conjunction allows us to do is to eliminate interaction effects. And it gives us only the context invariant part of activation relating to a specific cognitive process. Let's look at it, uh, look at an, um, an example. Um, it's a study where the researchers were interested in phonological retrieval. And they were wondering what structures in the brain support phonological retrieval, independent of the items. Um, here I um, have an object, and I'm sure you can all do the phonological retrieval. You first um, have the process of visual analysis, then the object recognition, then the phonological retrieval, the dice, and then when you spell it out, you have the verbal output. So these are the different processes which are um, su successively um, taking place when you do phonological retrieval and uh, naming, object naming, actually. You see, this is a study also from the 90s. Um, where they were looking at exactly that question. What is the context independent or item independent neural basis of phonological retrieval? Um, so what they had here is they had several conditions. Um, and each of these conditions um, were coupled with um, um, uh, different objects. Um, they had condition words, 
and um, the condition letters, the condition objects and colors. And in the um, in each of these conditions, um, they um, had the task A, which is name that object or word or letter. And they had a control condition where they just had to answer yes to this pseudo word, to this pseudo letter, to this object and to this um, shape. Let's go or, or let's let's walk through this experiment step by step to make sure that it's becoming clear. So in the words condition, naming a word will contain all those um, uh, processes which are listed, word reading, form processing, lexical orthography, semantics, and phonological retrieval. In the next condition, when you have to name the letter, you have again several processes, not semantics. Uh, the letter itself does not have the process semantics. In object naming, you again have the same processes as in word reading. And finally, well, with, with little differences here, but um, we will uh, we'll neglect this now. And finally, with color naming, you have um, forming color processing and again phonological retrieval, which means phonological retrieval is uh, the only cognitive component which is common to these uh, four conditions. Importantly, each of these conditions is first contrasted to its control condition, where the subjects have to simply say yes. Um, so you have the verbal output controlled for, as well as the visual perceptual um, processes. And if you do a conjunction analysis here, you ask what um, process is common to all these four contrasts, then you end up with this um, statistical parametric map, and you can see um, uh, activation in the inferior temporal and in the in the visual cortices, where um, the, um, um, the the conjunction revealed a common um, um, activation in the control condition uh, in the experimental condition compared to the control condition, um, which is associated with the process of interest. The conjunction itself um, is pretty easy to implement in SPM. We will go to a little hands-on in a second. Um, I just want to point out that the assessment of statistical significance here can be done in two ways. Again, you have your two, let, let's assume we have two contrasts. We have the contrast A, where you um, have the contrast image uh, as a subtraction from um, condition A1 minus condition A2. And you have another contrast, um, which is the subtraction from condition B1 minus B2. And you assume that in both of these two contrasts, you have your process of interest included. Now you can um, either ask which voxels are going in the same direction which means they are somewhat activating to um, this uh, in this contrast A1 minus A2 and A1, B1 minus B2. Um, then you are um, testing the global null hypothesis. You're testing a significant set of consistent effects. So which voxel shows a consistent, for, for instance, increase in both contrast images? It's about a, uh, they should show a similar direction and surpass a certain threshold. Um, but you can also ask, I only want to um, um, I only want to consider those voxels which show a significant effect in both contrasts. So they should surpass the significant threshold both in my first contrast image and in my second contrast image. Then we are um, left in this blue area, which is much more restrictive, much more conservative, but also um, minimizes the, the type 1 error that you falsely infer that um, the voxel is really um, engaging in both contrasts. 
Um, so for exploration, you can test the global null hypothesis, but if you want to be statistically safe, you want to make sure that you only consider those voxels which, uh, which significantly activate in both conditions, which is then the conjunction null hypothesis. Um, this is very easy to implement in SPM, which I want to show you in a second. First, I want to introduce you to a second task, which I will use also at a different um, um, uh, uh, to a different topic in this session. It's um, a task which is about um, social cognition. And more precisely, it's about agency perception and theory of mind. So the ability to infer a mental state in a different person. Um, and the task itself is pretty easy for the subjects. They're simply watching video clips. And the video clips are also pretty simple. They are just showing two triangles. And I want to show you the first condition, which is the theory of mind condition. And um, you can make up your mind while watching what this could be about. So one can simply one could simply say these are just two triangles moving about the screen, but I'm sure that most of you uh, would have seen more than just two moving triangles. Um, you might have seen uh, two triangles which are interacting and uh, which are um, um, cuddling and uh, and coaxing and um, uh, wanting to influence each other. Um, so in this condition, we are engaging in theory of mind. Now let's look at the second condition. So um, while watching, I can already explain because this is uh, pretty simple. Um, in this clip, uh, the blue triangle is imitating the red triangle, but you do not infer any bad intention or anything or good intentions in the triangles. You just realize this is some kind of goal-directed behavior, uh, which you would not um, uh, assume if this would be just um, an object. So you um, automatically infer some kind of agency. Um, and uh, when we look at the last condition, which is the a random condition, This is uh, pretty obvious that there is nothing goal directed going on. It looks like a screensaver, and you would not think that uh, those two triangles are animated to, to, uh, in, any, in any way. So these are the three conditions, and there are um, four clips per condition the subjects can watch. Um, and the, the, the clips themselves, they are about one minute in duration. Um, it's a block design. And now let's jump in into um, the SPM GUI. What I want to um, show you is the way how you can um, do a conjunction analysis. So um, first of all, here is the design matrix. You have your Tom condition. These are the four, and, and the white blocks are the four Tom videos. You have the goal directed condition. These are those four blocks here, and the third regressor is the random condition um, for videos here. You have two more um, regressors, which are some tasks the subjects had to do in between the uh, watching the video clips, um, and the motion regressors and the constants. So this is uh, the design matrix, and. Um, now you can look at the activation. What is um, what is um, um, sensitive to the watching the theory of mind video compared to the random video? Um, you can um, let, let's maybe quickly um, look at the contrast itself. 
So you would find activation in uh, visual areas, but also the TPJ, the temporal parietal junction, as well as in uh, prefrontal areas, which are all hubs of the social um, brain, social brain network, um, uh, which are relevant for processing social information. Um, you have um, also the possibility to compare uh, the goal-directed um, condition to the random condition. It, look, it leaves us with a very different activation if you if we look at um, the the um, uh, at a family-wise error corrected threshold. Now you can ask: um, Is there a common activation comparing theory of mind videos to the random videos? and comparing the goal-directed agency videos versus the random videos. When doing so, you, we do a conjunction analysis. So let's do that quickly. For this, you just select your contrast you want to um, combine in a conjunction. We said we want to combine the theory of mind condition with um, um, versus random with the goal-directed condition where this random and you select by holding just the control key. So you just select both, that's it. You press done, you, you're uh, directly asked what kind of um, analysis do you wanna do? Is it the global null or is this the, 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 the conjunctional? We wanna do the conjunctional, the more conservative. We don't wanna do masking. Let's be not that conservative in terms of thresholding. So let's do a 001 uncorrected threshold. And let's see what's left. And here we go. This is the activation which is common um, to both the goal-directed and the theory of mind condition compared to the random condition. And um, the conjunction uh, will lead to a um, design matrix and contrast weights like this. Okay, so you see that is super easy. Okay, let's go on with parametric designs. Um, and here we can um, write jump into uh, the, the linear association correlations of brain activation um, with some um, parametric modulator. So the question here we ask is, um, does our brain activity systematically vary with some other regressor? For instance, the pace we are doing finger tapping or um, some continuous attribute of a stimulus we're looking at. So for instance, if you change the luminance of a stimulus um, uh, you, throughout the experiment, you can track this on a volume by volume rate and then include this as a parametric regressor and correlate your brain response with. So the point is that you have a metric um, regressor on a continuum um, with more than two um, levels and uh, such relations can, could be linear for instance or non-linear they could also be data driven um, so you could also for instance um, include the erection time uh, the subject is giving trial by trial as a, a parametric regressor and correlate your brain response with so which brain response correlates with faster uh, um, responses or um, shows a correlation with the speed of your responses. Um, the nice thing about parametric designs is that it avoids the pure insertion because it is controlling uh, controlling itself. You are comparing the very same process just um, with a different um, quantitative level. For instance, loudness or frequency or whatever, but it's a control in itself. However, of course, we have to assume that um, there is there are no qualitative changes going on uh, while changing the degree of your um, regressor. So this would be a linear change. This would be uh, a nonlinear change or an exponential quadratic change, um, or you have a regressor which you extract from some experimental data. Also, again, a very old example from the, from the 90s. Um, this is about word processing. Um, subjects heard 
verts, um, which represented at different frequencies, at different rates, and the researchers here could quite well show that the primary auditory cortex, uh, the activation in the primary auditory cortex is correlated with the rate um, of word presentation. The faster, the higher the activation. Um, another um, important um, process we already encountered previously is adaptation. Our brain is changing dynamically and one of the big um, uh, or important, important processes our brain is doing is adaptation. Um, so adaptation occurs in, um, in, to every kind of stimulus and process. And you can be sure that if you present several stimuli repeatedly, you will induce an adaptation process. And this is something you can also quantify using parametric designs. Um, you can address this in two ways. Uh, which I want to show you again with this uh, data I brought with me. Um, you can either model each single block separately and address the time change or the change in, 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 in um, signal strength um, as a function of time by choosing your contrast weights accordingly. Or, and that uh, will be step two, you can use uh, parametric modulation based on uh, polynomial expansions. And uh, let's go with the first option um, first. So um, let's go back to our face processing task, um, where you, where we have four blocks, four blocks per condition. And you see that design matrix here is a little bit different now. Instead of modeling the four blocks per condition in one regressor. Here I've modeled each single presentation block as a single regressor. So we can address the, uh, each block separately. And what you now can check um, is, for instance, the habituation to your face stimuli by choosing according uh, the, the contrast weights accordingly. With this contrast weights, you are asking which brain regions show a continuous decrease in brain activation uh, with um, the uh, repeated presentation of our facial stimuli. If we choose this one, let's check the effect. Let's go with family white error correction 05 corrected and you can see here the habituation to faces is taking place indeed in the visual cortex and it looks pretty close let's maybe quickly also put a section um, to better localize the effect so if you put an overlay um, you can see very nicely the effect taking place here and here um, so these brain regions are showing a um, reduced response to faces upon repeated exposure. Um, you could, of course, also include or um, um, also look at the effect of adaptation um, for the shapes condition. We will come to, the, to, the, to this actually later. Um, so this single block modeling is a very handy way and quite flexible way to um, address changes in time, um, which could um, uh, happen in, in uh, for instance, uh, with, with repeated presentation of stimuli. Um, the design efficiency is not so good yet uh, because mostly you have only a few um, events in that regressor. So when estimating the regressor, it's, uh, there's not so much to, 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 to estimate. Uh, so uh, uh, elegant um, alternative 
are uh, polynomial extensions and uh, or expansions. And this is something SPM offers you um, in an automated way. So what is meant with this? Um, you can, if you have a parametric modulator, you define this when doing your, your onsets and your, your um, when estimating your design, when, when, when um, modeling your design. And you can tell SPM, this is a parametric modulator, and then you can just easily include a first, second, or whatever order of pol polynomial expansion to that modulator. Um, I want to show you an example here. Um, this was a study also pretty um, old from the 90s. Uh, it's a single subject. It's a patient uh, who had a stroke and um, they modeled again the response to increasing representation rate. Usually what you see and what could also be seen in that patient is that with increasing word presentation rate, the activity increases. And uh, this um, um, pattern, the slope, can be modeled with uh, a linear um, uh, parametric modulator. But you might also um, wonder whether there are brain regions which are showing an exponential or a nonlinear um, response to your parametric modulator. So here, what was done is they included, in addition, a quadratic term. So a polynomial of the second order into the design matrix as a separate regressor. And um, doing this um, uh, allowed them to detect brain regions which showed a nonlinear effect. Uh, for instance, here in the frontal cortex, which seemed to be um, somewhere in the um, vicinity of where the subject had the stroke, um, that person showed uh, an inverted U-shaped curve to representation rate. So it could be a quite powerful tool to not only look at a linear effect of a parametric modulator, say maybe response rates or um, uh, anything, any parametric modulator. Uh, it might be quite smart to always also look at the exponential nonlinear um, associations that parametric modulator might have. And this is very easily implemented in SPM. So let's check out also the um, uh, polynomial expansion with our face matching task. For this, we again um, go to the faces task here and we have um, habituation with the parametric modulation. Uh, the um, design mat matrix looks very different now. Um, again, you have a task regressor for the shapes and a task regressor for the faces. It's the first and the third regressor in this case. But now we ask SPM, I did not show this now because this would have been um, the, the, the design estimation. Um, we, I had uh, asked SPM to automatically also include um, a, a, a parametric modulator. And um, to this to this regressor, which is um, um, to this regressor, the shapes regressor, and to the faces regressor. So what can you see here? The parametric modulator um, models a linear increase, and this is a little bit difficult to um, to to see here, but I, I hope it, it 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 becomes clear when I explain it. Um, the first block of the shapes condition. Um, um, is associated in the second regressor with a uh, low value. Let's say it's minus two or minus three. Um, the second uh, block is associated with a less negative value. Let's say it's, it's, it's minus one. The third block has a plus one and the last block has a plus three. So you have a regressor which models a linear increase. And the same is done for the faces regressor here, a linear increase from negative or uh, low value to high value. And with that, um, you have modeled with one regressor, a linear increase, um, which is um, um, uh, uh, coupled to a certain condition. And let's now check the, habi uh, the, the habituation to, to faces. 
Um, Here, here we go. For the habituation, we have to reverse the contrast weight because the regressor itself gives an increase. So for the habituation, we have to say minus one. And when we now um, place this contrast weight, let's see how this looks like in the parametric modulation. And um, it looks very similar. Now I did uh, use the family-wise error correction. So they come to a very, uh, similar results, either with a single block design um, or with this parametric modulation um, option. Okay, so having checked out the parametric modulation, um, I want to show you a very cool tool or version of the parametric uh, designs, which are model-based regressors. Um, so this is an example um, for such a model-based regression. Um, the idea is that we um, that we um, have uh, like for uh, using using an ex uh, experiment which produces, for instance, uh, behavioral data. We can use those behavioral data um, to feed them back into the model and to associate your brain response with. This is a, um, a task which was using prediction error coding. Maybe some of you have heard of prediction error coding before. Uh, one can think of it as a amount of surprise a person has with respect to a specific outcome. So here the subjects learned that specific um, uh, abstract images are associated with a certain probability to win, um, to, 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 to win a reward. Um, and the prediction error is um, the higher, um, the more the subjects learned there should be a reward, but they did not uh, uh, obtain a reward in that specific trial. So the more the expectation was violated, the higher was the uh, prediction error. So this is a, a well-known um, computational model of learning. And uh, the researchers here extracted by um, modeling the reward prediction error, the, the, the value trial by trial for the reward prediction error. Uh, so you can see, for instance, uh, in the first trial, the subject was not uh, surprised at all about uh, the outcome of the trial. In the second, it was surprised a little bit more. Here, there was a big surprise. Uh, so the, the subject might have expected uh, to, be, to, to have a reward, but it did not appear and so on. So you can uh, really think of it's, it's, it's a, uh, the, the amount of surprise the subject had with respect to um, uh, obtaining a reward. And uh, not surprisingly, when feeding this regressor into your model and you're asking which brain region is coding this reward prediction error, you end up with, um, or the researchers <laughs> ended up with activation um, in the ventral striatum, which is uh, well known um, to be uh, one of the key hubs of reward prediction error coding. We can do this as well, uh, for instance, with our triangles. You've seen that the triangles are moving about randomly or not so randomly uh, the screen and um, these stimuli have been um, um, constructed in the early 2000s um, with the aim to match them as closely as possible regarding the low level kinematic information like speed of the triangles or the way how um, uh, the relative distance to each other because if the different conditions differ, like theory of mind, goal-directed and random, if they differ with respect to this low-level kinematics, you might not measure the social cognition aspect, but rather the perceptual aspects. Um, so there was a group of researchers who extracted the trajectories of the triangles. So you are able now to um, have a trial by trial or volume by volume regressor um, depicting the low level kinematic information, the speed of the one triangle, the speed of the other triangle and their relative distance to each other. And um, in order to uh, learn which brain regions are actually coding for those low level kinematic information, um, you can do a parametric modulation uh, using such a, um, uh, a model-based regressor. So let's do this quickly.
So here again, a quick information on the design matrix. You have all your um, uh, 12 um, video clips now, not in three separate condition um, wise regressors, but I, um, I modeled them now all in one single video regressor because now I'm not interested in the difference between the different conditions, but I'm interested in the kinematic information they contain. So each um, video can be found here, it's 12 videos. And now um, those three regressors here contain the information on the kinematics. This is the speed of the blue triangle, the speed of the red triangle, and this, uh, the relative distance to each other. Um, actually, this is the uh, first, it's the speed of the big and then of the little triangle, but doesn't matter. And um, what you can now test is, for instance, what's the mean activation in response to the variation in these low level kinematics? Which brain re uh, region is sensitive to this kinematic information? When you do this, you can put a one um, on each of those. Um, let's be not too conservative now in the thresholding. And you can see the mean kinematic information is um, correlating with uh, responses in the primary bushel cortices, which makes sense. It's pretty plausible. OK. Okay, so part three of this session. I hope you're still with me. Uh, I know it's a lot of information you're confronted with in each of the sessions. Um, we're now looking at factorial designs. Um, and with that, we also close again the, um, the problem, or the, we, are, we again address the problem of pure insertion. And the, with factorial designs, you can address the problem of pure insertion very well. Why that? Um, factorial design, per definition, allow us to assess interaction effects. And the problem of pure insertion is the problem of interactions, which we cannot address when we do simple subtraction. So with these interactions, um, we can even not only com control for them or um, eliminate them as we did in the conjunction analysis, but we look at them explicitly and quantify them explicitly in the interaction terms. Um, again, let's go back to the study where we have the phonological retrieval, but at this time, the study was a little bit different. The researchers were interested whether a specific part in the temporal lobe, in the inferior temporal lobe, is sensitive not only to phonological retrieval, but also for object rec uh, recognition. And again, let's start off with the design as it looked like in the first place. They did a, mod a modification to the design, and I really recommend the paper which is associated with that. I um, uh, um, wrote it. It's Friston and colleagues, 1996. Um, it's it's referenced on one of the upper slides. Um, it uh, shows nicely the problem of pure insertion. So, um, in this case, subjects um, had to say uh, had three different tasks in the first place. They had to say yes when they see an abstract image. This time. Um, in, in this condition, there was the visual analysis as a process and the verbal output. In the condition B, they had to say yes when they see an object. So we can assume that it's not only visual analysis and verbal output included in this condition, but also object recognition. And finally, they had to, in, in the, in the uh, condition C, they had to name the object. So it's not only uh, visual analysis, verbal output, and uh, optical recognition, but also phonological retrieval. And with successive subtraction, under the assumption of pure insertion, one would suggest that um, comparing A and B would give us the um, 
um, uh, brain activation to object recognition and B versus C would give us the brain activation to phonological retrieval. And um, what they found out uh, regarding the region of interest is, yes, we see an increase um, regarding uh, between A and B, which tackles object recognition, but we do not see an effect between B and C, which was the contrast which should identify phonological retrieval. So this is um, suggesting that this patch of cortex does not contribute to phonological retrieval with objects, which was very surprising. Didn't make sense in terms of what has been known before about that um, cortical area. Now they revised the, um, the uh, experimental design because the idea is, okay, we could now have um, uh, had an example of the violation of pure assumption. There might be an interaction effect, which we cannot address if we do not look at it on a factorial design basis. In order to have a factorial design, we need to be able to vary the two factors independently. So we need uh, a two by two design in order to address process A, the main effect, process B, main effect, and the interaction of both. So what did they do? Included another condition where they were asking to um, name the color of an abstract shape. In this case, we have the visual analysis, we have the verbal output, we have the phonological retrieval, but there is no object recognition. And with that, we have a two by two factorial design. It allows us to address main effects and interactions. And when now looking at the interactions, what they found out is that in the context of phonological retrieval, this cortical patch here, is showing very much a increase in activation um, in comparison to, um, like this is in the context of object recognition, sorry, I, I was, I was uh, um, reversing it. So in the context of object recognition, this uh, patch of cortex does differentiate between phonological retrieval and not. And this effect could not have been isolated without the factorial design. So this is a very nice example why it is very important uh, or which, what, uh, why it is a smart idea um, to use factorial designs when trying to um, address your research question because you can really explicitly um, inspect the interaction effects. You can easily also combine parametric designs and factorial designs. Um, the idea is pretty straightforward here as well. Let's say you have a condition A and a condition B, and um, uh, for instance, word presentation, um, or let's stay with the example which is shown here. Objects were asked to repeat, either repeat words, which were given beforehand at different rates, or they were asked to produce new ones, like verbal fluency, at different rates. Um, so these are two conditions. This is just repeating a word. This is generate a word yourself, and then you can um, do this at different rates. That's a combination of factorial and linear or parametric design. And what they could show is that uh, a region, the posterior superior temporal region is sensitive um, to the context. Um, so we have an interaction effect here. This region shows an increasing um, um, activation with increasing um, um, rate uh, of word repeating condition A, while in condition B, this same region showed a decrease. So this is um, a very nice example for an interaction effect. And we can do this as well very nicely with our um, faces task.
So here, let's go back to our faces. You can either look at interactions in the single block design. I already typed in an interaction effect here. It looks funny in terms of the contrast weights, but in order to address an interaction effect um, with time here, you have to uh, model a linear effect for the one condition. The first four blocks are the shapes blocks, you remember. And here you model a linear increase. And for the faces blocks, which are those four regresses, you model a linear decrease. And with this contrast, you're asking, is there a brain region which shows a linear increase with the presentation of shapes while it shows a linear decrease with the presentation of faces or other, in other words, is there an interaction of time and condition? Does the habituation um, between faces and shapes differ? So let's look at the effect again, not too conservative because this is already um, a quite strict um, 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 contrast, um, quite um, um, assuming quite, uh, uh, um, and let's say difficult or a, a, a very particular a time course. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, and you can see this is not very convincing what you see here on a first level basis. Now, um, let's see whether I have it also the other way around. If not, we can quickly also um, define a new contrast where we ask habituation shapes greater faces, which means we have uh, three, uh, one minus one, three and minus three. You might wonder why I have this um, positive and negative values. It's because they have to sum up to zero. That's a precondition for the design matrix. That's why you have to sort of um, uh, um, make sure that they sum up to zero. And here you just invert the, um, the contrast weights. With that, you have a habituation to shapes and an increased sensitivity to faces. And let's see whether we find a, a brain region which is actually showing this uh, direction of interaction. Well, Again, not very convincing what we find here. Um, as it is single subject data, it um, um, uh, effects uh, might uh, be too blurry and too noisy. And this is what this picture actually uh, uh, suggests. Okay. You can also address this with the polynomial functions. I don't uh, show this now in um, as hands-on, but uh, you practically um, not only look at habituation to faces, but you also look at the um, effect in the shapes condition where you also have this parametric modulator and you just um, uh, put the contrast weights um, in opposite directions. So this would again show an interaction between condition and time. And now let's come to the very last um, but very cool thing you can do with parametric designs and factorial design, which is a psychophysiological interaction. Um, actually, psychophysiological interaction is some kind of parametric modulation, one could say. Um, and the idea is uh, that we want to know whether a brain region, the activation of a brain region, is somehow modulating the activation in another brain region. Our brain is um, organized in networks. We all know that it is actually the case that brain regions modulate each other. And with PPI, with psychophysiological interaction, you can um, explicitly address this. Um, 
with a functional connectivity measure. And um, the idea is two um, brain areas which interact, they should also show synchronous activation. They should correlate which, uh, with each other. So here's an um, example of uh, a study who used PPI um, using a factorial design in the first place. So they um, had subjects in the scanner and they should they, they were presented such blurry images. Maybe you can already think of what's uh, what what those two images actually depict. It's very difficult if you don't haven't seen the original image. After the scan, subjects are shown the images in a non-blurred version. So they now learned what each image actually meant. And then they're shown again the exact same stimulus. Huh? Think of control condition might be a smart way like this um, because you have the very same perceptual input and um, then they are assessing the effects of uh, learning uh, having learned what the blurred images actually meant and um, this is a by two factorial design which they were addressing they could um, assess the main effects for instance the main effect of learning by comparing pre pre-exposure versus post-exposure. And what they found out is learning um, was highly correlated with, um, or uh, the effect of learning was associated with activation in the parietal cortex. So that was part one. Then they also looked at the main effect of um, uh, stimulus. We had objects and we had faces. And not surprisingly, we find activation, uh, the main effect, um, uh, simple, uh, the simple effect of um, objects, uh, greater faces was somewhere here in the inferior temporal cortex left, and faces versus objects uh, was somewhere in the in this hemisphere, um, also temporal, uh, but uh, also parietal to some extent. And uh, the researchers now wanted to know whether the parietal region we found out in the previous uh, main effect, this one here, which seemed to have been important for the learning itself, whether learning, um, um, the, the, whether this parietal cortex activity somehow influenced learning um, in, the, in the different um, similar specific areas. So what they did is they did a PPI analysis very quickly what they do or what is done by in PPI is you have your task regressor. For instance, here a main effect of task, um, let's say that uh, the that, that shapes and that faces, um, where you convolve, which you convolve with the HRF to have your model you want to fit your bold response to. Second, um, you find your seed region, mostly a priori, you should do it a priori, um, where you think that this region should entrain or somehow modulate um, the brain activation in other parts of the brain. They chose the uh, parietal cortex because of the main effect of learning. Um, so they extracted seed um, a, a time series um, of the parietal cortex, which followed nicely also the main effect of task, since this uh, was a region which um, was uh, uh, responsive to the main effect of task, so that makes sense. And finally, what you do um, for PPI, you um, multiply your seed region time series with a task regressor. So that you multiply blue with black, which gives you the red line. Um, due to the multiplication, everything which is um, not um, uh, negative in terms of the task regressor, um, becomes anti-correlated and everything which is positive in terms of the task regressor becomes correlated. So this regressor in red actually asks um, which region shows an increased connectivity with my seed region only during specific task conditions, but not during others. So it's a differential connectivity. Um, you always have to include your PPI um, uh, uh, the seed region, uh, the seed um, time series to your PPI regressor. So this is the task. Let's say this is the task. This is the seed region um, time course. And this is the PPI regressor, which is a multiplication of those two. And what they find indeed is that the, there was a coupling between the parietal cortex and the 
um, inferior temporal cortex. And strength and the direction of the coupling was dependent on the stimulus. So it's in the inferior temporal cortex, the coupling increased um, uh, only for the phasis condition. So the stronger the activity in the um, inferior temporal cortex or in the parietal cortex, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the correlation between those two was higher um, um, in the face condition, but in the, opt in the object condition, you did not find such a uh, positive correlation. Of course, we have to keep in mind um, this just correlational, um, these analysis in PPI. So you do not have any idea about the um, direction of flow of information. So Olivia, um, how uh, I think the sessions, when, when does the session stop actually? Uh, one minute ago. Ah, yeah. Okay. So we leave the hands-on uh, example here because I would have had uh, one PPI um, uh, example. Um, but then with this, we're at the very end. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your attention. I know it's a lot of information um, and I'm looking forward to your questions.